Today we'll look at Sacramento Morginis, which we started earlier. I filled this out a bit more with uh, really the, I was going to add in other things from from Merkelbach, um, from uh, his the section of his work in which he talks about all of the opinions that were in place before this. But this actually sums it up, this Sacramento Morginis itself, which is actually quite a short document. I've worked in almost the entire thing here. Not not every word of it, but most of it. It's quite short, actually, and it's uh, it, it lays out everything with all of the clarity we could possibly ask for. So this for us is of course of, of tremendous interest for a number of reasons, um, in uh, bo both being in the seminary and also in the, uh, the situation that we have uh, with regard to the invalid orders of the Novus Ordo. It's really because of this, uh, this document here, we know for a fact that, and also uh, in addition to it, the fact that Paul VI himself laid out what is the exact, he specified what is the exact essential form for, no, for Novus Ordo Episcopal consecrations, we know for a fact that those are invalid. It's not just a question of doubtfulness. It's, it's certain. Novus Ordo bishops are not bishops. There is no chance. The uh, doubt, doubtful sacraments are, is in, in, the, in the practical order, uh, are to be treated the same as invalid sacraments. As one may not receive sacraments from a doubtfully ordained priest or a doubtfully consecrated bishop any more than he may receive them from one who is certainly invalid. Whereas it makes certain differences, uh, doubtful sacraments are to be conferred again conditionally rather, to, rather than absolutely. If there, if there is, if the doubt is such that there's a true possibility that the sacrament was conferred, uh, and not, uh, and not, not that it was simply outright invalid, so it does make some differences. But as far as uh, treating it before its remedy, it's the same thing as as invalid, uh, uh, an invalid sacrament. A date to a very great extent, for all intents and purposes, the same thing as invalid for what we're talking about here. So. The, but with regard to the Novus Ordo Episcopal consecrations, it's not even doubtful. It's just invalid. Uh, it's certainly invalid. So, in the uh, uh, of course, only we only have one so far that I that I, that I know of. But uh, they, I've never heard of any other any others getting through successfully. But say any Novus Ordo priest who might uh, come to us uh, when he undergoes ordination, that'll be an absolute ordination. So he would be ordained. Alongside, this is we had last year, uh, four ordinations last year. One, a former Novus Ordo priest, uh, was ordained alongside all the others who had never undergone any ordination ceremony before. So it's it's no no not a question of doing it conditionally. It was just you know, it was his ordination together with the others. So Sacramentum Ordinis, and we started looking at this earlier, but we'll. Uh, we will start at the beginning here for the sake of thoroughness. As regards the sacrament of order, or orders, in Latin it's in ordinis, which is singular. In Latin, the sacrament of orders, or in English, we say sacrament of orders, of which we are now speaking. It is a fact that notwithstanding its unity and identity, which no Catholic has ever dared to question in the course of time, according to varying local and temporal conditions, various rites have been added in its conferring. This was surely the reason why theologians began to inquire which of the rites used in conferring the sacrament of orders belongs to its essence and which do not. This is true of all of the sacraments. You might refer to the, the rite of the sacrament, which strictly speaking is the essential rite, the essential matter and form. Or you might refer to the rites of the sacraments in a more general sense, referring to more, more properly the ceremonies surrounding its conferral. And we should never get the idea... That, under any circumstances, that the, the other ceremonies, what might be called the non-essential ceremonies surrounding the conferral of the sacraments, are in any way unimportant or may simply be dispensed with at will or that to disregard them does not include grave sin. Uh, not every ceremony is of the same gravity, but to, to omit the ceremonies that surround the essential rite of, of the Mass itself, of, of most obviously, but then also of the other sacraments, to omit those is, uh, is sinful. You know, with regard to the sacraments, there are some cases in which it might be, there might be justification for setting aside the non-essential rites in the case of say, someone who's dying, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the rites surrounding the, the full proper ceremonies of the, uh, in, uh, of the conferral of the sacrament might be dispensed with, but um, when it comes to certainly ordination, uh, there's 
there's, there's no title to do that. Uh, you know, it's done under controlled circumstances. All the ceremonies must be followed out. In fact, we'll see that towards the end of this document, Pius XII says, in essence, that I've laid down all the essential rights here, but don't get the idea from this that all the rest may simply be dispensed with. All, everything has to be done according to the, the pontifical, the Roman pontifical, which is the book, or it's usually split up into multiple volumes for uh, practical reasons, but the Roman pontifical includes all of the ceremonies that are done in, as the title suggests, pontifical setting. Which, which means uh, ceremonies that bishops do. So, uh, it's, it's, it's true that some, actually even in, in some cases, even priests who have not been consecrated bishops, but due to some special dignity that they have, may carry out pontifical ceremonies, but ordinarily uh, you, associate the, you associate that most immediately with bishops. Of course, the Pope, think of the Roman pontiff carrying out pontifical ceremonies. Bishops may also carry out pontifical ceremonies as well. So to keep it simple, we'll say that those are ceremonies that are carried out by bishops and are contained in the Roman pontifical. And uh, the, you know, they lay, lays out the entire rite. It's, like, it's much like looking at the Missal. It has rubrics uh, to be followed and the text to be recited. Uh, and all that must be adhered to just as much as the Missal itself must be, the rubrics of the Missal itself. Whereas that being said, in general, uh, the rubrics of any official liturgical book do not lay out every little detail. Uh, much of that is left to the authors, and that's for various different reasons. For one thing, the Missal itself, or the Roman Pontifical, is just not the right place to, to lay down all of that. For one thing, the books would become immensely thick. The Missals, for example, the altar Missals are already quite sufficiently thick, and would make them even thicker to lay out every little detail. Uh, many details are, in fact, laid out in the Ritus Servandus uh, and various other uh, documents uh, in the, contained in the front of the Missal. So quite a bit is actually laid out, but there is a great deal more that is not uh, because the book would just become too thick. Because uh, the, the, Also because the Missal is just not the place to take care of little details. It's just, in a sense, beneath the dignity of the, of the book, in a sense. Uh, that why would you put in a book that goes on the altar itself, that, that, that rests just a f mere, mere inches away from the, uh, from, from, uh, from, from the body and blood of Christ himself, why would you put in that particular book the details as to what the, the thurf were supposed to do at, at various times during the Mass? Why would you put in there the way in which the acolytes were supposed to hold the cruets? Little things like that are just not suitably dealt with in the Missal. And so we have to turn to authors. It would be helpful, actually, if there were uh, an official book or perhaps multiple books laying down all of those things outside of the, the books that are actually used during ceremonies. That would be nice. But in point of fact, uh, for a long time, and, and so it's what we're left with now, a great many things were just left up to the authors to describe. Various liturgical authors, rubrical authors, rubricists, experts in their fields, no doubt, but still obviously not having the authority of the Pope himself, most obviously, but neither of the uh, sacred congregation of rites to determine various things. So some things are just left up to the opinions of authors as to how it should be done, and there are various assessments as to what are legitimate customs and what are not. So keep in mind, there's a great deal of that we're, we're have to be considered in the carrying out of ceremonies as well. But what we're looking at here concerns essential rites. So we're talking about the rites in, with, of sacred ordination. We're talking about the essential matter and form. So the, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll consider all of it more closely now. So it also gave rise to doubts and anxieties in particular cases. So this speculation as to which are the essential rites and which are not of sacred ordination. And as a consequence, the humble petition has again and again been addressed to the Holy See should be the Holy See, that the supreme authority of the church might at last decide what is required for validity and conferring of sacred orders. This is actually a question I got recently. Was there any particular motive for Pius XII's definition of the sacrament, uh, the essential matter and form of the sacrament of orders? And it's a good, it was a good question because um, many times when the church defines anything, it's any, most especially uh, the first thing you think of is defining truths of the faith is because there's some challenge being made to that truth of the faith, to one or another aspect of divine revelation, because of which that truth is to be defined. I actually just had that uh, today. Uh, uh, Pope St. Damasus 
uh, presiding over the, uh, it was he presided over the Council of Nicaea, and it says that after that, despite all of the, the definitions of the church, the, the world groaned and found itself Arian. So, because uh, uh, the, the definitions of the church are oftentimes occasioned by that, okay, heresies are the occasion of uh, various definitions, dogmatic definitions, it is parachidens, a good thing, only parachidens, by accident, uh, and it's accidental effects, a good thing that those, that those heresies arise. But that was not, as far as I, I can possibly tell, this was not the case with regard to the sacrament of orders, that the very motive for defining these things is exactly what Pius XII lays out here, that uh, this was a, a practical concern, that there were doubts and, and perhaps only scruples, but that uh, there was a degree of confusion arising from the fact that this had not been defined, which altogether makes it rather surprising. Why was this not defined earlier? Could it possibly be that there were no doubts or scruples that arose before? Or perhaps, or perhaps just not the number that were, uh, that had come up by the mid 20th century. Uh, but uh, there, you know, there, there was also sometimes a problem of somebody who, after our nation might, uh, for whatever reason, might regret having embraced the priesthood, try to get out of it, by saying, oh, my ordination was invalid because of this or that thing, or I'm, uh, so I need to be uh, released, I need to go back to the lay state uh, for uh, various motives, many of which were no doubt something less than high. But uh, there was also that. There was that, that aspect of it. Oh, according to this opinion, this or that is uh, required for validity. I'm not sure that was done right in my ordination. Therefore, I should be uh, released from the priesthood and all of its obligations. Now, there were those who, who took that route, unfortunately. And so, all taking all this together, there was motive to define the essential matter and form of the sacrament of orders, but as far as I know, there was no, uh, uh, now outside of what Protestants say, but that's been around for a long time, there was no particular anti-holy orders heresy raging at the time. Um, that's something that would come up all the time with regard to the reign of Pius XII, uh, something that would be well documented, that does not seem to be the case. So, it's, uh, for these reasons, we define this. It also says that all agree that the sacraments of the new law as sensible signs which produce invisible grace, must both signify the grace which they produce and produce the grace which they signify. Now the effects which must be produced and hence also signified by sacred ordination to the diaconate, the priesthood, and the episcopacy, namely power and grace, and all of the rites of the various times and places in the universal church are found to be sufficiently signified by the imposition of hands and the words which determine it. So this is true, of course, of all of the sacraments, uh, matter and form, um, essential a matter, and then essential form that determines it. Besides, everyone knows that the Roman Church has always held as valid ordinations conferred according to the Greek rite without the traditio instrumentorum. The traditio instrumentorum, uh, the handing over in the, uh, in the case of the a priestly ordination, of course, uh, you know, chalice and paten, with all, according to all of the uh, specifications required by the rubrics. And there was, uh, for a long time, the possibility that that was required for validity. And if that was uh, somehow there was a defect in it, say there wasn't wine in the chalice or something, that that was a doubtful traditio, the traditio of doubtful validity, or the ordinary you know, trying to get out of it afterwards might say, oh, I wasn't touching it properly or something like that. And there was a true possibility that, uh, that, that that were true, that minor premise were true, that he was not touching it properly, that uh, that might indeed be a, a doubt concerning the ordination. And you can also consider, uh, of course, in our situation, we have uh, uh, four ordinations last year. That was a lot. That, that was something of a record. Uh, that, may, that may be, in fact, the, as I understand, that is the highest number of ordinations we've had uh, since the founding of the seminary in 1995. And you get converted to any one ceremony. And so for us, that's a, that was a high number of ordinations to have done all at once, four. Whereas if you look at that, that photograph up on the second floor near the Elsass entrance, you lose track somewhere around 40, counting the ordinance. There are many, many of them. So you think, uh, in, in, just imagine any one of those ordinances, just for example, I'm not, I'm not saying that was the case, uh, but just imagine that one, one of those ordinances some years later decides, oh, I want to try to get out of the priesthood. He could assert, I was number 23, and I didn't quite touch the chalice and patent correctly, and who's going to remember how number 23 did it? 
Uh, you would have to have a photographic memory to remember exactly who was the 23rd uh, ordinate, in fact, to approach the bishop and how exactly he touched the chalice in Patna. Maybe somebody could remember that, but that's what it would take to remember for sure. So you know, someone could, after the fact, start bringing all that up. Uh, and and you, know, you, see, you never know, with a large number of ordinances like that, that, there, there could, that could be plausible. Uh, so there, uh, the Traditio Instrumentorum, again, it was not certainly established, but it was according to one of the opinions, uh, so credible opinions, one of the credible opinions at the time, that that was required for validity. It had, it had to do with the statement of the Council of Florence, uh, which, is, which Pius XII is alluding to here, that seemed uh, to require it. It seemed to, perhaps it wasn't entirely clear, but it, it, many thought that it did. And we'll see now, uh, Pius XII points out here, though, that the Roman Church has always held as valid ordinations conferred according to the Greek rite without this traditio instrumentorum. So you might think, well, how is that possible? The church, you might think the church cannot change essential matter and form. The church cannot uh, legislate that different words be employed in the conferral of, uh, of baptism, for example. Uh, and yes, that's true. Of course, the church cannot change uh, that which is laid down by Christ himself, but the church does have a certain power over these things. Now, with regard to the Mass itself, Christ laid down exactly the words to be spoken, and the church cannot change that at all. At the very, very most, the church can allow Mass to be said in different languages. That's it. Those exact words were laid down by Christ himself. You study all this when you study the sacraments. But the church can permit a certain, again, without changing anything substantial, the church can permit certain differences. And then again, more religions talk about all of that with regard to different rites. So, uh, so and so is baptized, for example. That's an example of one such. Uh, or is so and so is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's considered valid. That's permitted by the Church and certain certain rites to say that. Uh, so you have a you have a certain difference there. It means essentially the same thing. Of course, nothing substantial has been changed. But with regard to certain other, so the Sacrament of Holy Orders, for example, the Church can determine more things. You know, if you look at the, this comes up sometimes with regard to arguments over the validity or invalidity of the Novus Ordo Episcopal consecrations, uh, whether that the essential form of the Novus Ordo Episcopal consecration was taken from some Eastern rite. And um, right off the bat, that can't be because the what is considered the essential form for the conferral of the power of orders. And keep that in mind here, we're talking about the power of orders, not the power of jurisdiction. Those are two separate things in the church. And with regard to uh, and further distinctions to be made even after that, but uh, uh, we're talking about here a power of orders, which of course the Novus Ordo Vatican II blurred those things, those two powers, on purpose for ecumenical reasons, which is outside of our scope right now. But the, uh, we're talking here about power of orders. So those ceremonies uh, in Eastern rites, which are certainly valid for conferring the power of orders, uh, are much longer than the Novus Ordo Episcopal Consecration formula. So you cannot say that it's exact, just lifted directly from that because it's the, just the number of words being so vastly different. It's not as a one or two words difference, some, some clearly non-essential word, a uh, word that would not change the meaning, we'll say, left out. No, it's just a, two, two very different prayers that are being employed here. Uh, that cannot possibly be. But that means also, yes, that the church can permit a greater, has, has more power to determine things concerning the sacrament of orders than certain other sacraments. Uh, so we, we could get into a whole discussion of that, to which extent the church has power to determine the essential matter and form, uh, in which ways, in which sacraments. But uh, uh, an indication of that is that it's unclear whether from the Council of Florence, from the texts of the decrees of the Council of Florence, whether or not the church actually intended to uh, require the traditio instrumentorum for validity, which means that in the practical order it had to be done for all those centuries, but it was unclear in itself whether or not that was actually required. So he says so that in the, uh, the, the church, though, uh, Clearly, only if it intended that, if Council of Florence intended that, only intended it with regard to the Roman rite, not with regard to rites that don't have it. So it's, in other words, it's some, clearly something that the church could say is not required for validity. But the church could add that, could require that that as part of the essential matter of the sacrament, lacking which the, the ordination would be doubtful. 
So, he says, though, that uh, the very, in the very Council of Florence, in which it was effected, in which was effected the union of the Greeks with the Roman Church, meaning that they were brought back from schism, the Greeks were brought back from schism, the Greeks were not required to change their rite of ordination or to add to it the traditio instrumentorum. So certainly with regard to the Greeks, the church did not require those changes to be made. Not, therefore, not saying this is indispensably necessary for validity. The church could never say, you, or you don't have to, in some, uh, I'm not aware of that this is the case anywhere, but you know, some crazy sect that might name only two persons of the Trinity and its essential formula for baptism, which would be invalid, the church cannot say, all right, that's okay, to only name two persons of the Trinity. You must, it is necessary by, by divine ordinance that all three persons of the Blessed Trinity be named in the conferral of baptism. So the church cannot dispense with something that is indispensably necessary for validity, but the church can dispense with things that may in fact be required for validity by her own laws, but which are not indispensably necessary, from which she can therefore dispense. So the Greeks were not required to change the right of ordination uh, to meet those requirements that may have been in force at the time. So, and it was the will of the church that in Rome itself, the Greeks should be ordained according to their own right. So any, any Greeks in union with the church visiting Rome and happen, happening to be ordained at that time should be ordained according to that right in the city of Rome itself. So it follows that even according to the mind of the Council of Florence itself, the traditio instrumentorum is not required for the substance and validity of the sacrament by the will of our Lord Jesus Christ. If it was at one time necessary even for validity by the will and command of the church, which clearly, it's, uh, stating here, can happen. The clue that can happen. If it was at one time necessary even for validity by the will and command of the church, everyone knows that the church has the power to change and abrogate what she herself has established. This is precisely what we've been saying. Wherefore, after invoking the divine light, we of our apostolic authority and from certain knowledge declare, and as far as may be necessary, decree and provide, that the matter, and the only matter, of the sacred orders of the diaconate, the priesthood, and the episcopacy is the imposition of hands, and that the form, and the only form, is the words which determine the application of this matter, which univocally signify the sacramental effects, namely the power of order and the grace of the Holy Ghost, and which are accepted and used by the church in that sense. So univocally, meaning that's the only thing that could possibly signify. And that's important when it comes to looking at the Novus Ordo Episcopal consecrations, because uh, uh, that, that, that is getting outside of our scope here, certainly, but it's definitely not uh, inappropriate for us to touch upon it uh, to this extent that, uh, keep in mind, the controversy concerning the essential form of, or the validity of Novus Ordo Episcopal consecrations concerns that exactly, the essential form, the words pronounced by the consecrating bishop. And this here, we're looking at his here completely abstracting from who was conferring, who was doing the ceremony. This could be a valid, uh, validly consecrated bishop himself could, kind of doing the ceremony trying to confer Novus Ordo Episcopal consecrations, the question, we're looking at the rite in itself. And the debate surrounds the use of the term princip, spiritum principalem, that is the thing that is, or uh, spiritus principalis is the, the, of course, the nominative, but it's, it surrounds that. That is what is uh, being requested of God to be conferred upon uh, this priest being consecrated a bishop. And this, of course, is completely abstracting from the, the, or, the validity of the ordination of the priest in question, the validity of his baptism, or any other problems that have since arisen in the Novus Ordo, it's looking at the rite in itself. Assuming this is being uh, rite of Episcopal consecration, being done by a validly consecrated bishop, trying to consecrate a validly ordained priest, a bishop. That's what we're looking at here. So it, it concerns that, that the term spiritus principalis. Uh, what does that signify? For one thing, nobody's sure. Uh, for one, uh, definitely, the church has not used that univocally to signify power of Episcopal consecration. Otherwise, at, at prime, on certain penitential days, we'd be asking to be made Novus Ordo bishops. Spiritu Principali confirma me. Confirm me with the governing spirit, or however that might be translated. Yeah, there also there are many different translations of that right into all the, of course, 
If it's ever done in Latin, the Novus Ordo Episcopal Consecration Ceremony, that's a very rare occasion indeed. But uh, the, uh, you know, what does that even mean? The church I mean, definitely has not used that univocally as the only thing it could possibly mean to signify power of orders. And even in the rite itself, again, notice there are two things that must be univocally signified, two separate things signified by two separate terms as the only thing that could possibly signify in this essential rite, power of orders and the grace of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so assuming, all right, spiritus, spiritus principali, suppose that means the grace of the Holy Ghost. Then where's the mention of the power of orders? It can't signify one, one intelligent theory, I'm using that term, sarcastically, that was put forward to try to explain this, is that it signifies two things univocally, <laughs> which is complete and utter nonsense. Univocally means that is the only thing that signifies. So, no, it, it signifies one or the other. If that signifies either one or the other, it cannot signify the missing one. It's invalid. But it doesn't even mean power of orders univocally. Spiritus principalis, or whichever case it is in the essential form. We could look at that more closely some other time. So they are so important we should repeat that. The only matter of the sacred orders of the diaconate, the priesthood, and the episcopacy is the imposition of hands. And the form, uh, the only form, is the words which determine the application of this matter, which univocally signify the sacramental effects, namely the power of order and the grace of the Holy Ghost, and which are accepted and used by the church in that sense. So, applying that to the Novotor Episcopal Consecrations, it's invalid. It follows as a consequence that we should declare, and in order to remove all controversy and to preclude all doubts of conscience, we do by our apostolic authority declare, and if there was ever a lawful disposition to the contrary, we now decree that at least in the future the Traditio Instrumentorum is not necessary for the validity of the sacred orders of the diaconate, the priesthood, and the episcopacy. So he's not, you notice he's not settling the question as to whether that was valid or not, or required for validity or not, the traditio instrument order. In fact, he, say, he says that, he, alludes to, he comes back to that later, and at the end, towards the end of this document. But that in the future, certainly, whatever may have been the case before, which is, he's not settling, whatever may have been the case before, now, without a doubt, not required. As to the matter and form and the conferring of each order, we have our supreme, same supreme apostolic authority decree and provide as follows. In the ordination to the diaconate, the matter is the one imposition of the hand of the bishop, which occurs in the rite of that ordination. And also, uh, uh, it, it is, there is in fact no essential difference between one hand and two hands. That's generally true in sacred rites. The, uh, one hand and two hands have the same signification. Whereas by the rubrics, one hand or two hands are to be used, but there is no essential difference. For, for, for God to, so in the case of a bishop, and that has happened in the past, there are cases of that, of, of, bishop, perhaps for, of, of any given bishop perhaps conferring many orders during the same ceremony, as can happen, that uh, perhaps just, uh, just getting rubrically mixed up, uh, imposing one hand on the heads of the, the ordinance to the priesthood. That's still valid. That's, uh, there's, no, there's no doubt of that. That is certainly still valid. And though there are some who have insisted to the contrary, uh, but they are, in fact, incorrect in that. But that is also another, another story that we can get into some other time. That's not for right now. So, the, yes, and certainly there, according to the rubrics, there is indeed to be only one position, a position of only one hand on the head of a subdeacon being ordained deacon. You might be asking, and it's a good question, if so, what about the subdiaconate? Uh, is, uh, why is he not defining the essential matter and form of the subdiaconate? And indeed, that is a, really a, a good question, which we can attempt to answer at least by saying that it seems, especially in light of this definition, that the subdiaconate is probably of ecclesiastical institution. That's still an open question. Uh, he did not, clearly, Pius XII did not intend to define that here. He doesn't even mention the subdiaconate. But it seems that, given what he's, he's talking about here, talking about the, uh, what is required for the substance and validity of the sacrament by the will of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, uh, that talking about the traditio instrumentorum not required for the substance and validity of the sacrament by the will of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. So it seems he's talking about here, from the whole context, is 
the orders, in other words, the, the orders defined or established by our Lord himself. And the church can establish orders that definitely tonsure and those orders that are to this day considered minor orders, those are of ecclesiastical institution. Our Lord did himself did not establish the order of porter, did not establish the order whereby you were given the keys to go unlock the church doors. That was not established by our Lord himself. Uh, of course, he could have, but he chose not to. Uh, uh, that was left to the church to determine. And the church has determined that even long prior to the diaconate, it is fitting that clerics coming up to the ranks should be granted various different powers only gradually. And keep in mind also, just while we're on that thought, that uh, the order of acolyte, serve the, the order whereby one then serves mass uh, ex officio, uh, is a higher order than exorcist. Exorcist is the one down from that. Those are, they're many times conferred in the same ceremony. It's, it's routine to confer porter and lector in one ceremony and exorcist and acolyte in the same ceremony. It's not permitted to confer more than one major order on the same person in the same ceremony. But uh, the minor orders today uh, grant uh, little more than uh, an indication that this, this cleric is advancing towards the priesthood. Once you get to the point of receiving minor orders, you're uh, that... Uh, yeah. But put it this way, when you, once you receive minor orders, the next thing you know you're receiving is the uh, it comes It all comes pretty rapidly. It follows rapidly after that. So, they, 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 so it makes really tonsure, actually. It's, actually it's, not, it's only since the Code of Canon Law was promulgated in 1917 that uh, it's required that uh, the tonsure be conferred not earlier than the beginning of uh, the uh, study of theology, the, the theology years in the seminary. Prior to that, it, it was less strictly regulated. But that means that really tonsure, once you've been tonsured, um, uh, then minor orders come shortly thereafter. Tonsure is really the, the point at which everything really accelerates up to then. It's, uh, it's, it's of course, e even, even up to subdiaconate people sometimes leave uh, practically on the eve of receiving subdiaconate. But uh, much more often, uh, departures occur, of course, before even the reception of tonsure. Uh, so e even though after that reception, as you said, people might still leave, there's still the definite testing going on to see whether um, just for that, whether a person wants to lead this life, uh, to dedicate his entire life to living like this. Um, uh, but uh, before that, before tonsure, the, the, there is, uh, there, there's a higher chance of, of, of a departure um, before, as before actually being initiated into the ranks of the clergy. Uh, a cleric is one who has received tonsure. Once you enter the clerical state, there's a much higher chance that you'll remain in that state than before entering it, obviously, but after having entered the seminary. And so the, uh, the, the ta tantra minor orders all follow pretty rapidly after a certain initial testing of a couple of years at least has been done. And uh, when it's been determined that this person is, uh, there's a higher, much higher probability that he will persevere than in those earlier years. So it follows as a consequence that uh, we should okay, we should declare then or read this in order that to, in order to remove all controversy and to preclude all doubts of conscience, we do by our apostolic authority declare that at least in the future the traditio instrumentorum is not necessary for the validity of the sacred orders of the diaconate priesthood and the episcopacy. So again, uh, coming back to subdiaconate, it it does seem that it's an ecclesiastical institution. In fact, at one time it was considered a minor order. And the traditio, there is no imposition of hands or, or essential form naming both the grace of the Holy Ghost and the power of orders to be conferred. So it seems that it's not of, of divine institution. It's not to put down the importance of the subdiaconate at all. It is uh, the, the final step. That is the commitment to life, uh, for life, to the clerical state. And at that point, of course, the cleric then has the obligation of reciting the divine office. Uh, every, in full every day, unless legitimately excused or somehow dispensed. But there is even so, for the, sub for the subdeacon, there is this difference uh, between himself and, and, the, and, say, a deacon or a priest or a bishop. That is, he does not say dominus fobiscum in private recitation. It's in the rubrics of the breviary itself. That when a, a subdeacon is reciting the office any time in which, uh, see, during the singing of the office, the celebrant sings the Dominus Obiscum, he says, Domine exaudi oratione meum et clamor meus at deveniat. Unless, of course, that has come immediately before in some other uh, say, in a series of, of preaches or something like that. 
but uh, it means that uh, not until he's received the diaconate is that considered the public prayer of the church. That, that, the, uh, that the, in that case, the deacon, priest, or bishop is, um, is reciting. That his doing that, that is a liturgical action. Whereas a subdeacon doing it is not a liturgical action. Okay, so as to the matter and form and the conferring of each order, we have our same supreme apostolic authority, decree, and provide as follows. In the ordination to the diaconate, the matter is the one imposition of the hand of the bishop, which occurs in the rite of that ordination. The form consists of the words of the preface, of which the following are essential and therefore required for validity. And also, to be clear here, the preface that we're referring to is not the preface that precedes the canon of the Mass. There are many different prefaces that arise in various different ceremonies of the Church, some every year throughout the liturgical year, for example, Holy Saturday, uh, there's a preface that accompanies the uh, exultet, the blessing of the Paschal candle. There's a preface, another preface there on Holy Saturday uh, for the, uh, uh, the blessing of the baptismal font, the, the blessing of the Easter water and the baptismal font. There's a preface involved in that. You know, prefaces come up uh, quite often, actually, in various liturgical settings. Uh, and they, that includes also, uh, there's also the, the Vigil of Pentecost as well. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the dedication of a church or, or the consecration of a church, there's a, there, there are additional prefaces. So prefaces come up all the time, uh, uh, even outside of the, the actual canon of the Mass itself. Another example, actually, Palm Sunday. There's a preface uh, for the, what is called the Dry Mass, the, the, the set of ceremonies preceding the actual celebration of Mass on Palm Sunday. The blessing of the Palm Ceremony has the structure of a Mass. There's a whole reason for that. Uh, whole set of reasons why that is the case, but that dry mass, so to speak, itself has a preface. But the thing that follows that preface, after the singing of the epistle and the gospel, which is just as at any mass, uh, we're talking about a high mass here, uh, after the singing of the epistle and the gospel, uh, there is a, a preface, the sanctus is sung, just like at any mass, uh, but then instead of going into the canon of the mass, the celebrant goes into the blessing prayers for the palms. And then after that, the procession is held, and finally, the Mass. Mass is celebrated. So, it's, uh, prefaces come up all the time in various liturgical settings, and the preface we're talking about here is the preface uh, uh, that, pre that is part of the ordination ceremony proper. And you have to, every time there's an ordination ceremony, you have to consult the authors uh, and the rubrics of the liturgical books to determine at which point <clears throat> the Mass is to be put on hold, so to speak, and you go into the ordination ceremony. So, uh, for uh, the, the, the entire Mass, to a greater or lesser extent, undergoes changes. Uh, I'm not talking about the canon of the Mass, but uh, even, even then, during a priestly ordination, there are, the Mass is concelebrated, so the rubric, there are different rubrics for it. But when, uh, when they have major orders being conferred, minor orders to a lesser extent, but major orders being conferred, there are differences in the rubrics of the Mass itself. And the, the Mass is um, sometimes, in, in some cases, put on hold at various points. And you have to, it depends on the, the, litur the, nature of the uh, liturgical nature of the day where exactly the Mass is to be put on hold. But when it is put on hold, indeed, you have the whole ceremony. The or there are various other ceremonies attached to it, as we've said. But the ordination ceremony proper, the main ordination part of the ceremony, includes a preface. When it comes to the diaconate, the priesthood, and Episcopal consecration, there is a preface. And indeed, uh, the essential form is considered to, or the, the words of the essential form are contained within those prefaces for the diaconate, the priesthood, and Episcopal consecration. So the, the form for the diaconate consists in these words which are essential and therefore required for validity. Emite eneum quesumus domine spiritum sanctum, quo in opus ministerii tui fideliter exequendi septiformis gratiae tuae munere roboretur. That's for the diaconate. And also keep in mind, you might be thinking, well, if he's uh, singing the preface, might, might there not be a risk that to make a mistake in singing or, or in, pro in pronouncing the form and therefore run a risk of making it in doubtful, or doubtful or invalid? And the answer is yes, there is a risk of that, which is precisely the reason why after this, uh, it doesn't seem to be contained in the document itself, but certainly thereafter, there's, it may have been the decree of the SRC, we'd have to locate it, but these, these essential forms were no longer to be sung. 
So if you find these, uh, if you find pontificals that were published after Sacramento Mordinis, here in 19, this is published in 1947, if you find uh, pontificals published after that, the chant stops at a certain point, and then the essential form is given in just normal text for the bishop to read as he recites it, and then after that he goes back to singing. And so you see that for, in all, in all those different books. Of course, the books that we use in many cases, uh, it's difficult to find pontificals that were published under Pius XII that, aren't, that, that haven't undergone any kind of changes, uh, but that are also pre-John XXIII who did make changes. Uh, so without any Novus Ordo wards changes, for lack of a better term. It can be difficult to find that. Uh, so what we have to do is use those same books that have the, 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 ch the form in, in chant in many cases, but also we'll have, uh, uh, we've also done this, very carefully proofread documents, uh, not only the books themselves, but have uh, very carefully proofread text of the essential form specifically for that moment, either from, um, from a later pontifical or something we've done ourselves, and um, proofread with extreme care, obviously. But we've done that before. Because you, you know, the idea is you have, you have to uh, put maximum focus into getting the essential form right. Don't bother singing. Don't bother singing at that point. The bishop is clearly instructed. Don't bother singing. Just get the essential form right. So then in ordination to the priesthood, the matter is the first imposition of hands of the bishop, which is done in silence, uh, but not the continuation of the same imposition through the extension of the right hand, nor the last imposition to which are attached the words Acipe Spiritum Sanctum, Quorum remis, remiseris peccata, etc. So that is not, so that comes later on in the ceremony, a point at which the, the priests, uh, the ordinance are already ordained, in fact, but they're still ceremonies symbolic of the conferral of the power to absolve sins that are carried out. And that imposition of hands, and that was debated before, whether it's both of those, and clearly everybody agreed that all, all indications in sacred scripture are that a, a imposition of hands is required for validity. But the question is, was just one or the other uh, sufficient? Uh, and, uh, but uh, Merkelbach, for one thing, writing before this definition, explains that if just one or the other is omitted, you have to, you have to fix that. <laughs> Certainly if the first one, I have to look at what exactly he says more closely. And as of right now, in the practical order, it doesn't matter. Um, but he does say that uh, definitely you cannot take that second one to be sufficient. Definitely he says that. So you do it. So in any case in which that first one is omitted, he says, in fact, the ordination has to be done from, from the start. You have to, the whole ceremony has to be done again. Uh, ex integro, anyway, he says. Uh, so the essential form, the essential matter, is that imposition of hands done in silence, which is easily the, the most striking moment of the ceremony. There are many striking moments, and many very striking moments, in the ceremonies of priestly ordination, but that is number one. Uh, the imposition of hands done in silence. And then also it makes it still more impressive if you have a number of priests present, or any priests present who are not functioning as deacon or subdeacon, but other priests present also then impose hands together with the bishop. Very famously, the bishop imposes hands on the ordinance and then stands there with one hand raised. So that's the continuation of it. You know, that is not, uh, <clears throat> he says that that is not the essential matter, uh, not the continuation of it. But he doesn't, in fact, continue it by doing that. And then all the other priests present, you know, bishops included, they're there, also impose hands uh, on the ordinance. And uh, then after each one has done, done that, each one comes individually. It does it certainly in our settings. We have enough, usually few enough ordinance and few enough priests present that each one can do it individually. Then stands there also with his right hand raised uh, in imitation of the bishop or the ordaining bishop until all the priests present have done that. And then after that, all the priests who have just imposed hands then return to their choir stalls. So, yeah, it's all done in silence. There's not any singing, there's no organ music playing or anything. It's all done in silence. No words spoken by the bishop or the ordinance, anybody. It's all done in silence. So it's very, it's very striking for many reasons. Uh, the, the gravity of that moment is very well emphasized by the rubrics. When they are, especially, well, certainly when they're carried out correctly, everything is, uh, focuses on that moment as one of the greatest gravity.